Richard Ojeda, Democratic presidential candidate for 2020, he already announced, and we discussed that recently. Um, he's been throwing haymakers at everybody in sight since announcing that he's running for president. So he went on uh, TYT interviews recently, and he laid out uh, detailed policy ideas and his vision for the country. Um, and he also went on MSNBC and uh, spoke about a little bit of what his strategy will be going forward. So let's watch this, and then we'll come back and, and talk a little bit more about Richard Ojeda. And then I'm going to give you my reservations about him. Hmm. See, he's get, gotten, you know, based, almost totally positive coverage on this show. Um, but I don't want to give everybody the misimpression that I agree with the dude on everything because I don't agree with the dude on everything. And to be fair to him, it's, I don't even agree with Bernie Sanders on everything. There are uh, many issues where I, I don't agree with Bernie. I, you know, one example is Israel-Palestine and, and BDS. Uh, but I digress from that. That's a longer conversation for a different day. But uh, in the case of Richard Ojeda, there's probably uh, some more areas where I, I don't agree with him compared to the number of areas I don't agree with Bernie. Um, but let's let's watch uh, a compilation here of his interviews, and then we'll talk about it. I'm wondering, based on what you've seen on the campaign trail in your own home state, I, a lot of people like you used to vote Democratic. And in the last election, we've seen them swing hard uh, to President Trump and Republicans. What are Democrats doing wrong? Why is that? And what's the disconnect between, you know, blue collar working folks in America and the Democratic Party? Well, I love this question. Uh, and, and I will tell you, I've said this quite a few times. The Democratic Party got away from but what being a Democrat was. But here's another thing that they do and the mistake that they've made is they place it on money. It's about you got two people running for office and this guy right here has the most money and this person here doesn't. But this person here is hungry. They'll knock on every door. They can relate to the people. But the only thing that the Democratic Party was thinking of is, but this person has the most money. So they automatically jump on board with this person. And in the event, in the end, the, the person who doesn't have the most money ends up being drowned out. But then you have the Democrat with the most money running against the Republican that out fundraises him three to one and who also gets every commercial on Wheel of Fortune. And in the end, it's, it becomes the, the lesser of two evil. And that's what we've got. You know, it's always been, well, it's always just the lesser of two evil. Just tactically. Mm -hmm. The way you've addressed Donald Trump, there are some people, there are almost two camps who say a lot of people ignored him in the midterm elections. They believe that worked. Just talk about the economy, talk about health care. And then there's another camp that says in 2020, you've got to be combative. You've got to play Trump's game. You've got to fight the way he fights, get in the mud with him. What would be your approach to the president? Now, I'm going to say I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight. But we're not going to we're not going to be able to beat this guy. Uh, by, by being nice, you know, he's not nice. The Republican Party's not nice. You know, we got, it's, it's like, we got to stop fighting a, a battle where our enemy is wearing brass knuckles and we're carrying a pillow. Hmm. It's time to knuckle up. I noticed that you started your campaign um, with a message against corruption. Uh, for uh, people that did not see that, uh, what is what you're calling the first pillar of your campaign? Well, it's about, you know, uh, doing away with all the pigs at the trough. Uh, you know, we've got people here that, you know, they say that they that they, you know, are going to serve the people. But in reality, they, they become congressmen, they become senators. And after one or two terms, they're worth millions upon millions of dollars. You know, they go in there and they legislate themselves to, to you know, to wealth. And that's exactly what they do. You know, I, I, I absolutely uh, am against that wholeheartedly. Uh, you know, they they go there and, and they focus more on doing for those lobbyists. Uh, because those lobbyists are the ones that are kind of dangling the carrot in front of them, and they're going for it every time. That's got to stop. We need to get rid of the backdoor dealings that go on. That's why I said I'd like to see body cameras on every single lobbyist and, and, and would make it to where they weren't allowed to mingle around the hallways. They can only come to the Capitol for specific meetings, and then the people could actually you know, type in their, their representative and watch those actual meetings take place. So as a state senator of Virginia, uh, West Virginia, uh, you backed uh, a free and fair elections resolution from Wolfpack. Uh, wh why did you do that? Well, you know, it's about I, I want to support getting big money out of politics. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that's absolutely crucial. Even at the state levels, we see how how money is controlling everything. Yes, and uh, you're a co-sponsor of that, and I wanted people to know that, and uh, I think that's really important. But in your anti-corruption stance, you say that if you're going to go into Congress, you have to give away all of your money except for a million dollars. So uh, you have to give it away to charity. So where are you going to put all of your millions of dollars? 
Well, I don't have millions of dollars. You know, uh, you know, the average family income where I'm from is forty-four thousand dollars. So, telling somebody that they get a you know a, a retirement of one hundred thirty thousand dollars with a cap of two hundred fifty thousand dollars is phenomenal because nobody has that anywhere where I come from. Middle America, the average citizen out there does not have nothing like that. All right, uh, Senator Jetta, let's talk about uh, your policy planks, though. Uh, where are you on the issue of choice? Uh, I believe in a woman's right to choose. I say that I'm pro-life because I want to see a reduction in abortion. But the truth is, every Republican is pro-life until the mistress gets pregnant. I bet you Donald Trump knows a little something about that. You know, I, I believe in. I want to see a reduction. I would quadruple the funding to Planned Parenthood without a doubt. So now I'm going to keep it real with you, though. You know, it's um, it's easy to say you're pro-life, and and it seems like you're at least consistent about your position on that. Uh, but if you're saying in, in legislation you would allow the women to choose, uh, legislatively you would be pro-choice. You know, I've always said pro-life, but once again, we've allowed them to take that term away from us. You know, they're not pro-life, they're pro-birth. They do away with the programs to feed the child, to educate the child, to clothe the child. You know, I want to see a reduction in, in abortion, but I will tell you that you know I do not like telling a woman what she can do with her body, and I will support her right to choose. So how about the issue of health care? Um, some folks are saying let's just patch up uh, Obamacare. Uh, some are saying public option or a Medicare option. And of course, there's also Medicare for all, which would be a uh, single payer. Uh, so uh, what are you in favor of? I'm for Medicare for all, but it means everyone, to include Congress, to include Senate, to include the president. No more golden plan. They get the bronze package like the rest of us do. Uh, what's your stance on immigration? I support DACA, and I want a pathway to citizenship. Now, that's exactly what I want. How about guns? Uh, I know that in West Virginia, you've got a different situation than you do maybe in some of the bigger cities in the country, et cetera. So what's your view on guns? I support the Second Amendment, but I throw the NRA paperwork in the trash. I don't need to be a member of the He Man Woman Haters Club to support the Second Amendment. You know, I want to do away with the the, the loopholes in gun shows. You know, I I don't have a problem with background checks. Okay, uh, how about uh, AR-15s? Uh, AR-15s. You know, when it comes to something like that, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I I want one. Okay, I will tell you this that you know I think that mental health is a major issue that we have. We got to remove the stigma of mental health. But I don't. If a person doesn't have any mental health issues in their background, they're not a criminal. You know, I don't have a problem with them being able to purchase a firearm like that. How about bump but stocks? You need to be responsible for your guns. If you own a gun and you allow that gun to fall into the hands of somebody that has mental health issues or a child and they use it, then you're responsible for it. So the NRA sometimes is opposed to having serial numbers on, on the weapons um, or uh, allowing for fingerprint technology uh, that would only allow the owner of the gun to use it. Or in, in fact, in some cases, uh, they're against uh, outlawing armor piercing bullets uh, that were also known as cop killers. Uh, what's your stance on those? Yeah, I think that the NRA is absolute garbage. I, I, let me tell you something, I, I'm proud to have an F rating from the NRA. Okay, well, that's clear. <laughs> okay, one more on gun control, bump stocks. No need in them. So I think uh, those are interesting clips for a number of reasons. Specifically, the talk with TYT, I find uh, more interesting because they touched on many of the issues that were considered Ojeda's weaknesses going into this election. Because you're going to be running in a Democratic primary. And the populist and anti-corruption stuff is wonderful, but it's not like the, the social issues are meaningless. They do matter. And you're not going to get through a Republican or excuse me, Democratic primary, you know, being uh, pro-life or anti-immigration or pro-Second Amendment without any uh, reasonable restrictions and without supporting any kind of gun reform. So I, I think that going into this, he wanted to address a lot of those concerns and let everybody know where he stands. So on the issue of abortion, um, I had read previously in an article on 538 that Ojeda said he did not support abortion except in cases of uh, rape and incest and if the life of the mother is in danger. That's what I read on 538. Now, is that true? I don't know. I don't know if Ojeda said that or didn't say that, but I did read in an article on 538, it's a relatively recent article, 
uh, and they described his position on abortion as uh, he's okay with abortion, but only in cases of rape and incest and if the life of the mother is in danger. Now, if that is his actual position, I disagree with that. Now, I, I'm, I still consider myself relatively moderate on the issue of abortion because I, I support Roe versus Wade, but what that means is um, up until a certain point, I believe it's totally uh, the right of the woman to choose. But I think that after a certain line, viability uh, of the fetus and when the nervous system is developed, then I think it's fine for states to regulate um, after that line. So I'm still somewhat moderate on the issue of abortion, but Ojeda's original position seemed like it was like he was further to the right than me. And I looked at that and I went, uh, I don't know about all that. Uh, now, on the issue of immigration, it's I think people have been giving him a hard time on that one. But I got to be honest with you guys, I've never seen anything uh, particularly concerning from Ojeda on the issue of immigration. Um, when he was asked about Trump's wall, he called it stupid and he said, um, you know, give me a shovel in five minutes and I'll find a way to get under it or over it or whatever the fuck he said. Something along those lines. He said it to um, Rebel Headquarters. Um, that is all I had seen of him talking about immigration. Now, maybe I had missed something, but in this interview, the position he laid out on a great, uh, on immigration, I think is perfectly reasonable, and I, I have no concerns with him on that front. Um, and on the Second Amendment, I, again, I, so what he's describing is, I think, somewhat of a moderate position. And again, if you go back and watch every segment I've ever done on uh, gun reform, what do I say? That's another issue where I call myself relatively moderate. Um... I believe in all of the basic reforms that the American people believe in. And it seems like Richard Ojeda is similar to where I am on that front, except maybe slightly further to the right, because he says, you know, on the AR-15, he's like, yeah, whatever, I think we should let people have them. I'm more open to potentially banning assault weapons, and more importantly, I think um, that makes sense, particularly because the... Um, the polls on that are overwhelming. It's like 60% of Americans that are fine with uh, banning assault weapons. But more importantly, I agree with him on on the, on the most of these ideas. The idea you ban bump stocks, the idea you have universal background checks without any exceptions whatsoever. Um, so again, I consider myself relatively moderate on the issue of gun reform. And it looks like Ojeda is right there with me. Uh, and also he bragged about an F rating from the NRA, which means he can't be. I mean, Bernie had a D rating from the NRA, and I was totally fine with a D rating from the NRA. Uh, so an F rating, okay, fine. Um, you know, that's that's fine by me. I think the NRA is insane in terms of how extreme they've gone with their uh, pro-gun position, almost to the point of arguing that no reforms at all are ever merited, even if it's like 93% of the American people that support it, like 93% support universal background checks. So I think the NRA is nuts. But I'm not on the side of uh, banning guns. And to be fair, I don't know how many people on the left actually are in favor of banning guns. But to the extent that there are people who are in favor of that, I, I don't agree with them. And I think I'm relatively moderate on the issue of gun reform. I would do all of the basic reforms that the American people want because I don't think they violate the Second Amendment. And I think that they're pretty straightforward and reasonable. And again, those ideas include, uh, you know, banning high capacity magazines doing universal background checks, no exceptions whatsoever, having uh, stringent uh, testing and including mental health uh, checks if you're going to own a gun and, you know, a, a plethora of other ideas that I think would definitely tick down the overall number of gun deaths that we have in this country. But so so to this point, nothing has really bothered me about Ojeda. The uh, abortion thing I, he's a little to the right of me on that, it sounds like, because he had used the term pro-life to describe himself, which I don't agree with at all. The position that they laid out in 538, I definitely disagree with. But what he said here, I don't... He said he quadruple funding to Planned Parenthood, and he supports a woman's right to choose. So on that front, he seems like he's not saying anything uh, questionable here. I will say that I do understand people who would make the point, well, there is a little bit of a flip-flop flop there, isn't there because when you look at what he said to 538 or what 538 says he said versus what he's saying now that there is a little difference so it's like okay you were pro-life and now you're pro-choice but you still describe yourself as pro-life i think to a lot of people they're gonna go why not just give me somebody who's good on all the issues but also there's no question about where they stand on this on this issue um and i do think it's totally legitimate and fair 
to hold a, a flip flop against a politician because it shows that there was not consistency was not a main thing that was driving them, if that makes sense. The areas where I'm a little concerned, um, climate change is one. Now, if I was a West Virginia Democrat, would I be have been totally anti-coal? No. Um, at the same time, is the correct position to say, hey, listen, we are going to have to, over time, wean ourselves off of coal and diversify our economy and make it so that everybody has jobs and everybody's paid well, but it's in a field that's not going to eventually go extinct, you know? And that's a tough pill for a lot of people to swallow. Um, and I don't know the time frame that we're looking at here in terms of how long to transition off of fossil fuels or how long to transition off of coal. Um, but I do know that that transition has to happen, that it's not a question uh, that we, we don't have a choice on that front. So for climate change, that's one slight reservation. Now, other areas where I have reservations, uh, foreign policy. Now, again, to be fair to Richard, uh, according to TYT, in his race against Carol Miller, Carol Miller went after Ojeda because Ojeda apparently said, hey, maybe we shouldn't have our troops, you know, willy-nilly all over the place and we should only send them to fight when it's absolutely necessary and um, we should bring the troops home. And then as a direct result of Ojeda saying that, Carol Miller lashed out at Ojeda and basically questioned his, you know, his record in the military or whatever, some hacky smear attempt. And then Richard Ojeda released an ad where he said, you know, it's the famous, I cannot accept that ad, um, where he goes after Carol Miller and he kind of touts his war record and says like, you know, I've been protecting your freedoms and you're saying this kind of stuff about me. It's ridiculous. So there are uh, examples of him uh, being more, non-interventionist, but it is true that when you go to his website, or at least uh, the stuff he was saying in the last race uh, against Carol Miller, it is true that there's stuff there about, like, we're going to bomb ISIS, we're going to go on the offense against ISIS, and, um, you know, that is, simply put, for a guy like me, hard disagree on that one. No, I think that uh, we need to get out of the Middle East, and I think that we've only exacerbated all of these problems overseas. I think we have been guilty of war crimes. And I know this is tough rhetoric to swallow, but in many instances we have been the terrorists doing violence and particularly doing violence against civilians for political ends. So we're bombing eight countries right now. There's been a 432% increase in drone strikes under the Trump administration. Thousands of civilians are dying. Look at how we're aiding and abetting a genocide in Yemen. I believe in the Chomsky principle. Uh, you know, I believe in you're only responsible for for what you do. And for me, since I look at what the U.S. does around the world and it's uh, overwhelmingly negative in terms of our foreign policy, what I say is, well, then let's just not do negative stuff anymore. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean that if there's a direct threat of violence against us that we can't do self-defense. In fact, the only time I support violence is in instances of self-defense. But let's not kid ourselves. Afghanistan is not about to attack us. Iraq is not about to attack us. Yemen is not about to attack us. Pakistan is not about to attack us. Somalia is not about to attack us. We have 900 military bases around the world that cost $100 billion a year to maintain. We wasted $7 trillion in Iraq, killing hundreds of thousands of civilians, uh, including many of our, our own soldiers died in these wars. So I'm done with regime change wars. I'm done with uh, the empire. You know, and listen, if there's a genocide happening somewhere and we need to, and by the way, assuming we're not on the side where we're perpetuating it like we are in Yemen, but if there's a genocide going on somewhere and people want to stop it uh, in one way or another, okay, I understand that impulse. It's a, it's a human impulse, but you have to make sure that this isn't hijacked by people who are only in it to expand the empire and jack natural resources and maintain our position as the sole superpower in the world because that's what happens. People like Bill Kristol and Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld they end up hijacking these situations, a natural human impulse to help people, and they hijack them for nefarious purposes. So if there is a genocide and we want to address it, absolutely, I say, you work with the UN, we don't go unilaterally, we work with the UN to stop any of these situations, and I think we put an onus more on humanitarian aid than we do on military aid. But yes, you can be involved with the world and prevent genocides, but you do that in an intelligent way with the rest of the world, 
uh, we should be a nation among nations, not a nation above nations. Because we can't say, oh, in the U.S., we're so wonderful, we believe in equality and justice, while at the same time saying, we believe in American exceptionalism, which means what? Another word for exceptional is supreme. So American exceptionalists are American supremacists, which is not a good thing. Okay, so let's keep everything in perspective here. No, we're done with these interventionist, dumb regime change wars. I would cut the military budget probably in half. I would cut our 900 bases probably in half. Um, and I would make sure that we get out of the Middle East and no, the world would not fall apart if that happened. There'd actually be uh, a, a lot less dead civilians, fewer dead civilians if we went with my approach. So e even though Richard Ojeda served, and I'm not trying to undercut what he's been through because... No doubt he's seen some shit, and I'm a little bitch in comparison to somebody like Richard Ojeda. But I'm, I'm not cool with candidates who are not crystal clear about, hey, let's end these unnecessary regime change wars. I don't want to hear any more about, oh, bomb, let's bomb ISIS, let's bomb ISIS to smithereens. We've been attacking Al-Qaeda since 2001, and guess what? Now there are more jihadists in the world than there were when we started the war on terror. So it's, an, it's objectively a failure. In the same way the drug war was a failure. Oh, let's wage a war on drugs and let's limit or eliminate the number of drugs in the world. Well, now there's more drugs and we wasted trillions of dollars in the process. And now there's dead bodies also laying everywhere as a result of the, the drug war because it's a literal hot war. So it's a failure. I'm done with it. And the only kind of rhetoric I want to hear from any Democratic candidates uh, is the Tulsi Gabbard style rhetoric on uh, foreign policy. Where she's like, yeah, no, let's not do regime change in Syria. Let's get out of Iraq and Afghanistan. And the Ro Khanna uh, approach on foreign policy where he says the same thing. And then every now and then Bernie sprinkles in some non-interventionist stuff. Even though he doesn't put an onus on that, he talks more about economics. But I still think on those positions, um, he's not given enough credit. Because uh, I think on most of the foreign policy issues, he's been one of the best, if not the best, uh, in Washington, D.C. But yes, I understand that this is the, the Democrats' attempt to be like, we're not weak. We're not soft on terror, but you have to flip the argument and you have to make the case that no, actually the strong thing to do, the intelligent thing to do, is to not willy-nilly send young men and women to die overseas for no good reason. So, uh, I, if I was Richard Ojeda, I would totally eliminate all that goofy stuff about, oh, we're going to keep bombing and, and go on the offense. No, we're not going to do anything. We're going to pull out because that's the right thing to do. And that's not going to exacerbate the problem. In fact, that's going to help fix the problem. Um, and by the way, the number one issue that would stop terrorism, that would reduce terrorism massively, is if we stop arming Saudi Arabia and so-called moderate rebels in Syria who are actually jihadists. Stop arming the entire frickin' world, and then they won't have the weapons to carry out many of these attacks. Everybody laughed at Jill Stein when she brought that up, but she was totally right. You want to talk about a serious... Uh, policy proposal to help drastically reduce the number of terrorist attacks. Stop arming the people who are the terrorists. Very simple. Very simple. The final thing about Ojeda that to me, I, I don't like at all. Because I really, overall, I really do like the guy. I don't want you to get the misimpression from this segment. I think he's wonderful on anti-corruption issues, on populist issues. I actually believe Ojeda when he talks about how he cares about union workers and the working class and ending the corruption, he has the boldest platform in terms of ending the corruption compared to anybody I've ever seen. Um, and I actually think he will stand with workers in a way that might be unparalleled by anybody except Bernie. Um, but the thing, the thing that I cringed at hard is in that same 538 article I spoke about recently. Apparently, Ojeda has never really voted for a Democratic president. Now, listen, everybody knows I'm no fan of the two-party system. And I go after Democrats very, very harshly when I think it's needed and when I think it's the right thing to do. But let's be serious. If you looked at John McCain and Sarah Palin versus Obama and Biden in 2008, coming off of eight years of George W. Bush, who's arguably the worst president of all time, and you couldn't realize, I know people who are Republicans who looked at McCain and Palin and Obama and Biden, and these are not, these are like actual hardcore Republicans. 
And they looked at that and they went, yep, I can't do it. I can't vote Republican. Why? You're going to put John McCain in there and have Sarah Palin a heartbeat away from the presidency? And remember, this is 08, before we knew that Obama would become a rather milquetoast corporate centrist, okay? And this is 2008. And you supported McCain and Palin over Obama in 2008? To steal a phrase from Richard Ojeda, I cannot accept that. <laughs> I just can't do it. I mean, that's like, dude, Mitt Romney versus Obama. There was nothing redeeming about Mitt Romney. Now, again, to be fair, Obama by, at that point had kind of showed himself to be a corporate centrist. So I understand people looking at Obama like, uh, like you're not doing what I wanted you to do. Like, I get that. Looking at Obama and going... Man, you should have done things a lot differently, and you should have been FDR 2.0 in terms of the economy and really went hard. And I get all those criticisms of Obama, but there were no redeeming factors about Mitt Romney. None. So when it comes to Trump, a lot of people are giving uh, Ojeda a lot of crap about, oh my God, you voted for uh, Trump, and you know I, I can't accept that. But I think you have to hear them out in terms of the argument. So with Trump, and I pointed this out, which is why I said, look out, Trump can beat Hillary. He was doing populist rhetoric. That's not my opinion, that's a fact. So he was talking about how the trade deals are terrible, NAFTA is terrible, I'm going to kill TPP, you know, I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to cut Social Security, I'm not going to cut uh, Medicaid. So he was unique among Republicans in that he was making noises that were much more pro-worker. Now, ultimately, in terms of his actions, there's been 93,000 jobs outsourced under Trump's administration, so... He's been a failure, and he hasn't helped workers, and Richard Ojeda recognizes that now and talks about that. But when you hear Ojeda talk about why he supported Trump in the 2016 election, he went from Bernie Sanders in the primary to Trump in the general, even though that's a horrendous vote, and I massively disagree with him. It's not like Richard Ojeda supported Trump because Trump was saying, let's do nationwide stop and frisk, and let's uh, ban all Muslims from coming into the U.S., in fact, somebody like Ojeda looks at that and goes, that's gross, and I hate everything you're saying there, but at least I don't think you're going to destroy the economy here and outsource all the jobs, and... Uh, I, that's why I'm going to support you because I think you're actually going to help potentially help workers more than the other side. Now, that again, that didn't turn out to be true. Trump was a disaster, but Ojeda's explanation is all economics-based, populist-based, worker, workers-based. So I can actually give him a pass for that, even though I think he's dead wrong, and even though it was a gross thing to do, and even though he did overlook bigotry in the process of that vote. What I can accept is, you look at Mitt Romney, you look at Obama... Or you look at John McCain and you look at Obama and that you voted for the Republican? Mitt Romney never said a populist thing in his life. Mitt Romney was openly running on outsourcing the jobs. He fucking outsourced jobs with bank capital. So did Trump. Trump outsourced jobs too for his own companies. But um, you had, uh, and I'm sorry, it wasn't bank capital. That's his, uh, you know, private equity thing. It was a different thing that he outsourced jobs in the lead up to the election when the campaign was happening, which is crazy. He was an owner of a company that started outsourcing jobs. But, um... You look at a guy who's in favor of so-called free trade, outsourcing all the jobs. You look at a guy who's, you know, openly elitist. I mean, that's what Mitt Romney is through and through. You look at a guy who's never deviated from right-wing orthodoxy, was in favor of uh, cutting Social Security and Medicare and all that stuff. And you support Mitt Romney over Obama? Come on, man. Come on, Richard. That's not cool. But, okay, final point I'll make here because I don't want, I don't want this segment to be just me shitting on Richard Ojeda. Um, I actually think he's going to be a giant net positive in the Democratic primary. Because, as I said before, when it comes to issues of corruption, when it comes to issues of being pro-worker and populist, I think he might be the best on stage. And the other thing is, on all those issues, the worker issues, he means it. I believe him 100%. He means those things. So, he's going to be described in many instances as like, oh, he's the most conservative one on stage. I don't think that's fair by a, a, a long shot. I mean, a guy like Michael Bloomberg is way to the right of a guy like Richard Ojeda. In fact, in many instances, Richard Ojeda will be the furthest left on stage. I mean, his plan to deal with lobbyists, his plan of like, oh, you're going to live like the rest of the people in the country. You're going to max out at like a million dollars or whatever his plan, specific plan is on corruption. Um, you know, that's stuff that honestly is to the left of Bernie and it's pretty awesome. 
And the other thing about Ojeda is, even though he's going to have a hard time in the primary, I actually am totally convinced that if it was him versus Trump in the general, he would destroy Trump. He really does know how to fight. And he really does know how to make a case for these left-wing positions. And he really does have a strong streak of anti-elitism in him. In a different clip, he said, you didn't see it here, but he went on to say, um, uh, why do I think I'm going to be good uh, for this race and for the election? Because everybody's tired of the Goldman Sachs Democrat. I'm the, I'm the working family Democrat. Oh. So there are areas I have of, of concern about Ojeda, but overall, I think he's going to be a net positive in the race. And I think he's going to do a lot of, I think he might functionally end up being like Bernie Sanders' attack dog because he will be a bulldog and he will bulldoze the, the corporatists who are on stage. And, you know, whether it's Kamala Harris or Cory Booker or um, Michael Bloomberg or Tom Steyer or any of these people, I think that he will, anytime anybody has a hint, just a smidgen of elitism in him, I think he's going to, you know, come with a brick and clonk him over the head. So I just wanted to lay out everything about Ojeda here. I think net he's a he's a positive. I think he's going to be a good candidate. But I wanted to address the areas of concern that other people have pointed out. And, you know, the other thing people were saying were like, oh, he's not even for Medicare for all. Well, he did come out for it. And I kind of thought he supported it all along. I mean, you could disagree with my assessment on that. But when you support Bernie Sanders in the primary, clearly you're not objecting to Medicare for all. That's one of his main policy things he was running on. So I don't agree with the people who are like, ah, oh, he's not good enough on health care. I actually totally disagree with that. But that doesn't mean there are other areas where I have concerns. Again, I get the argument of consistency uh, is more important. So Bernie's been saying the same goddamn thing for decades. So why would you take the person who maybe flip-flopped a little bit when you could take the person who has been consistent all along? Totally get that argument. And as I said before, if Bernie jumps in the race, and I think he is going to jump in the race, my support goes to Bernie. But I do like Richard Ojeda, despite some of his um, his downsides, and I wanted to lay out all of that stuff for you guys in this long segment.